Thank you. So, of course, when you're invited to speak at a rational and science convention, what's the first thing you do? What's the subject you think of? Vampires, of course. If you're wondering who the hell I am, um, I write about religion, superstition, and being human at that website, and this is my Twitter handle. So if I do anything incredibly embarrassing and you want to take a picture and post it to Instagram, uh, that's how you, you, you tag me on Twitter. Uh, I'm also the editor of The Skeptic magazine. We've got various illustrations of people at the bottom. There's this woman with colored hair. Uh, <laughs> so we have magazines outside if you want to stop and take a look on your way out. Now, I should warn you, you're going to have to work a lot for this. I'm going to do some of the talking, but you're going to do the rest of it. We're going to have a vampire quiz throughout this. So what it consists of is I will be talking, and then a slide will come up, and it will be a famous vampire, and you have to shout the name of the vampire, the name of the actor, or the name of the film. OK? And whoever gets it right gets a pair of gummy fangs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So my lovely assistant, Carl, over there will be here, there for that. And we have, we have a test one. You're not going to get this much notice in the future. But we'll just do a test now. And whoever, whoever wins this does get the gummy fangs. So one, two, three, go. Dracula. Dracula. I think it was a gentleman in the middle there. There we go. Pair of gummy fangs. And it is Christopher Lee. Yes. Christopher Lee as Dracula, the, uh, the wonderful hammer incarnation of Dracula. Now this is, the, uh, you remember this from True Blood, Bill Compton? Um, this doesn't have vampire quiz written across it, so nobody wins gummy fangs, sorry about that. But what we get, you can see that Bill Compton is very articulate, he's very intelligent, he's very sexy. He probably doesn't smell like a rotten old fish. So this is the kind of vampire that we have now. This is a literary, filmic type vampire. This is some artwork um, that I got from uh, a band called Sopper Eternus. They're a kind of a, a German um, dark band. And uh, this is the title artwork to their album, Es Reiten de Toten so schnell. so schnell. Who speaks German here? My deepest apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you can probably tell that. But the reason that I use this artwork, and you should all go and download all their tunes and everything, is because I think this is far more of an illustration of what a real folkloric vampire was. There's a, quite a contrast there. Here's another image from that. It, it, it's a horrible, carnivorous, needy, dead thing. So folkloric vampires aren't incredibly nice. What do tra traditional vampires actually do? If we were to take uh, a definition from history and see what they do. Well, we've got this one from Zopfius. Vampires issue forth from their graves at night, attack people sleeping quietly in their beds, suck out all their blood. Um, those who are under the fatal malignity of their influence complain of suffocation and a total deficiency of spirits after which they soon expire. And uh, some who at the point of death have been asked if they can tell what is causing the problem reply that persons lately dead have arisen from the tomb to torment and torture them. So that's a kind of an encapsulation of what the folkloric vampire was supposed to have done, and that was written by Zopfer in around 1733. I heard over there, you were really quick, but there was, there was a lady over there I heard. Who was that? There you go, yeah, at, at the back. Yeah. Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Interview with the Vampire, of course, and it was a good novel too. So the V word, we're left with the V word. Uh, and it is a very promiscuous word. Look, this is an American politician. You can apply it to every kind of situation that you like to think of. Uh, and this is Mitt Romney. It has been used in relation to him. In fact, Voltaire used the V word. He said that we never heard a word of vampires in London, nor even in Paris. I confess that in these cities, there were stock jobbers, brokers, and men of business who sucked the blood of people in broad daylight. <laughs> but they were not dead, though corrupted. So, <laughs> plus ça change, huh? You know, um, Voltaire way back then was, was drawing the equivalent of, for vampires and bankers. And it, because it is such a potent image, it can very easily be used for everything. It can be, it can be just used all over the place. Uh, Jan Pikowski, who's a professor of Slavic languages, said that uh, the Bulgarian Empire, he reckoned that this was sort of the, the center of the word, 
um, was from where the Slavic term vampire originated. None of the standard Slavic etymological dictionaries offer a satisfactory origins for this word, and for my sins, I sat down and read them. Uh, so there, there's, there's all these theories, but basically the word is there. There are lots of similar words from Slavic languages. There's upir from um, Russian or, or, or Czech, uh, upior from uh, Polish, um, upirina from Serbo-Croat, and it's been theorized maybe it came from uber or ubor uh, from Turkish, and that it was basically an imported word into Slavic. Who knows? So let's ignore the literature and the metaphor. We're going to get past those. We're going to get past the Bill Comptons and the sexy vampires. We're going to look at folkloric vampires from Greece, the Balkans, and the surrounding areas. And we're going to look at when they just exploded onto Western Europe in the 1700s. I'm sure you're right, but it was in Bulgarian. <laughs> Give that man some gummy fangs. I think he got it right. This is, this is Grandpa Munster. Do you remember the Munsters? No. Okay, well, you get the next one. So, in fact, really, the reason for this is not that vampires were suddenly invented in the early 1700s. There wasn't a feverish outpouring of imaginative um, folklore from one certain area. What happened was, as I'm sure you know, being Bulgarian, that for many years there were invasions from the east, there were pushes back from the west, and so the, la the land that is currently occupied by what would have been vampire territory was in fact presided over by um, a lot of Turkish powers. And when the Austrian Empire pushed back, they found themselves, all of a sudden you would have West Western Catholic powers administering people who had peculiar, um, you know, pe peculiar rituals and things like that. They would, they didn't know what to make of it. A key one was the the Treaty of Pazarevich um, in 1718, and that pushed the Austrian Empire back. And that's why we get a lot of military reports back from these areas where they are presiding over a peasant class who previously pres been presided over by Turks. It's reasonably safe to assume that Slavic vampirism in the form in which it penetrated into the West in the 18th century evolved in the Balkans starting around the 9th century um, as a result of the conflict of Slavic paganism, Bogomilism, and Orthodox Christianity. This conflict culminated in the eventual victory of orthodoxy and the subsequent relegation of pagan and Bogomil ideas to demonology. Again, that's Jan Pekowski, and what he's pointing out is that even when you have a religious orthodoxy on the top of something, it quite often doesn't totally extirpate all of the folk ideas that run underneath it. Bogomilism was um, a heresy, and it was a dualistic heresy. Christianity is not a dualistic religion. It doesn't believe in the power of God and the power of devil equally. God is in charge, and he lets the devil get away with whatever he can do to tempt us. But ultimately, God is in charge. Where you have genuinely dualistic religions, you really do have a fight between the light and the darkness, and you don't know who's going to prevail. Uh, Zoroastrianism is a dualistic religion, for example, and Bogomilism, Bogomilism was a dualistic religion. So what you've got, rather like you've got fairies in Western Europe, the fairy folklore runs parallel with the Christianity, um, that Jan Pekowski feels that the vampire for many centuries was running parallel with uh, Orthodox Christianity, and I agree with him. Now, in Western Europe, people responded to all of these reports um, with, I mean, they, they just absolutely loved the stories. There was a kind of a lurid frisson to be got from them. Lots of universities wrote these very, very uh, learned books, great, great amounts of, of, of um, coverage on them. We're going to go through two stories, two stories of a vampire uh, hunt and see if we can pull out some of the themes from it. The first one is that the bottom spelling there is probably a more authentic Serbian spelling, but the top one was the Germanized spelling that we got from the guy who wrote the report for us, Peter Plajogovic. Now, he was imperial provisor from Bald, and he went to to witness this. The police, are, the uh, local people asked him to come to Kislova in what is now Serbia. And um, Plajogovic had been dead for 10 weeks, so you would reasonably expect there to have been a certain number of processes, burial and decomposition and so forth. However, within a week of his death, nine people had died of a 24-hour illness. And uh, several reported that he had come to them in their sleep. He had laid himself on them and throttled them. They couldn't wait for a dispensation from Belgrade. Um, Provisor Frombal was very apologetic about this. He really didn't want to go around and be a part of desecrating bodies. But 
the local peasants knew exactly what to do and they were desperately worried. And they said, if we wait for a dispensation from Belgrade, then the whole village will get wiped out. We, we simply cannot wait. When he saw the body of Plajogovic, he was very surprised. He said, I did not detect the slightest odour. Uh, the body, except for the nose, which had somewhat fallen away, was completely fresh. The hair, the beard, the nails, they were coming through. He felt that there was some fresh growth and that the old skin had peeled away and that there was a fresher skin underneath. He also said he saw some fresh blood at his mouth and he then said which he had sucked from the people killed by him. So these were things that imperial provisor Fromble didn't expect to find. Plajogovic was staked, which was the custom, that's what people did, um, and as he was pierced, much blood, completely fresh, this is an opinion, bear in mind, flowed through his ears and mouth. There were other wild signs. Anyone want to guess what that's a euphemism for? The vampire... <laughs> gas, gas, nearly. The vampire Plajogovic had an erection, so he was pleased to see them. <laughs> Uh, and the corpse was burned to ashes. <laughs> dusk till dawn, dusk till dawn. Yes, it was satanic a pandemonium. Who in here has seen dusk till dawn? <laughs> Who hasn't seen dusk till dawn? Tonight, you need to go out and buy <laughs> dusk till dawn. It's a fantastic movie. And the second vampire we're going to look at is the case of Arnold Powell. Again, we get a military report. It comes from the Austrian Empire. Now, Arnold Powell had died considerably before they wrote this report. It was about 10 years or so. Um, so they never got to see him completely, but they, they uh, saw his victims uh, sort of a, a little way down the line. Now, he had fallen off a hay wagon and broken his neck, so he fulfills one of the criteria for a potential vampire suspect. Um, they tend to be people who are unliked or people who die a premature or violent death. Um, he reported that he had been bothered by a vampire in his life and in order to get rid of the vampire, he had eaten some earth from its grave and smeared itself in his blood. Does that sound, does that sound good to anyone? Get rid of a vampire by covering yourself with its blood? We'll return to that later, it's important. People were bothered after his death and four died, so this had been many years prior during Turkish times. There had been an exhumation. Um, they reported, the local people, that he had been quite complete and undecayed and that fresh blood had flowed from his eyes, nose, mouth and ears again. The old nails, same as Peter Plajogovic, along with the skin had fallen off and new ones had, had uh, grown. And the same as Plajogovic, they drove a stake through his heart, whereby he gave an audible groan and bled copiously. So this was the history to the story. The body again had been burned to ashes and returned to the grave. In the three months prior to the um, military people coming, another 17 people had died. So this vampirism hadn't, hadn't gone from the community. In fact, it was reckoned that the, the contagion had persisted in the livestock. Perhaps one of the previous vampires had got to one of the livestock and then people had eaten the livestock and died and they, they were trying to work this out. The people who they exhumed in the graveyard to see whether they were vampiric or not, there was a woman who had died aged 20 after a three-day illness following childbirth. Her uterus was inflamed and malodorous with the placenta still in place. So you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out why she actually died. Um, her baby had been buried and then pulled out of its grave by dogs and partially eaten. This is very interesting because how many dogs do you think can get to graves these days? They probably can't. These were, we're, here we're looking at scavengers that have a very good sense of smell, and dogs and wolves really, really do, and shallow burial and burial without coffins. People were usually buried in winding sheets. Coffins are very expensive, and it's difficult to dig six feet under at certain times of the year. Um, a woman had been buried with her child soon after parturition and six weeks and five weeks, respectively. The mother and the baby both had fresh blood in their thoracic cavities and hearts. So again, we get this fresh blood thing coming up. And an old woman um, appeared to be plump and healthy in death. Her blood was liquid and her viscera were fresh. So she had been spare and lean and now she looked plump and healthy. And in fact, there's a, a Greek word, tympanios, which refers to the kind of drum-like nature of some vampires. And you could see that that would be if somebody was a bit full of air, full of bloated uh, from microorganisms. And that there's actually words for it. There was a 20-year-old woman, Stanica, who had been dead for over two weeks. And she was fresh with a flushed and ruddy complexion. When she was moved, fresh blood flowed from her nose. 
Two teenage boys, one prepubescent girl, a woman, a man, a baby, and an old man were found in a vampiric state. And they did find other corpses who weren't in vampiric state. They were happy with the way they were. They had decomposed sufficiently, and they thought, no, you're OK. You're not a vampire. But all of these vampires, they treated as vampires and did what they needed to do. The heads of the vampires were cut off and the bodies burned. I didn't... <laughs> was, was it... Yes, OK, lady over there at the front... Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula with Gary Oldman, very good film, beautiful art direction. So what are the themes from these two examples? I picked these examples because they really are very, very typical. Um, the themes that we can see is that there are epidemics. There's epidemic death. And it doesn't necessarily have to be all from the same disease. It doesn't have to be epidemic death as we would, re as we would recognize it. It could just be clusters of death. When there's too much death, people start to get nervous. There's decomposition. People clearly didn't expect what they saw when they dug these bodies up. People failed to decompose properly. There's scapegoating. There is a great sense that if you can perform a ritual, if you can heap all of your, your anger, your misery, your fear onto one thing, perform a ritual and do something, then it makes you feel powerful. It makes you feel as though you can be an agent in the situation. And the other thing is the throttling or night visits. So we'll go through these one at a time and actually treat them and see if there is anything that we can get that is reasonable out of this rather than folkloric or mythical. Do you know what? I'm so tempted to give you that because it's, it's actually Barlow. Salem's Lot. Salem's Lot. Yep, Salem's Lot. That was it. Yes. That is um, Barlow from Salem's Lot, and he is a Nosferatu-type vampire. People quite often say, oh, Nosferatu, and it does look like Nosferatu. It's, uh, it was a very successful translating the Stephen King story into a two-part, I think it was two-part TV series. So with the themes and epidemics, various people have suggested that diseases have given rise to um, the folklore of vampirism. There's rabies uh, and porphyria. They both have something to recommend them. Porphyria makes you um, nervous of going out in sunlight. However, folkloric vampires do go out in the sun, so that's a bit of a dead end. Rabies uh, it can cause you to foam at the mouth. The thing with both of these theories, I think they're thrusting in the right direction in relation to illness, but they do take rather a willful ignorance of the depth of vampire folklore out there. You've just got to pick the bits you want, really, to make them conform to these theories. Um, when you get onto plague, I think there's something a lot more substantial there. Uh, it could be bubonic plague, which swept across Europe in waves for many, many centuries, or many other kinds of diseases. Uh, there are all sorts of epidemic diseases which can cause sort of um, the folklore associated with vampiric outbreaks. Count Orlok. Count Orlok. Yes, that was Count Orlok. That actually was Nosferatu from the classic 1922 film. And the reason I put him here is because he is explicitly connected with plague. So is Dracula. When Dracula comes along, he brings plague with him. Count Orlok really does. He walks through this German town and he's just bringing plague. That is a sense in which the vampire is absolutely correct. Vampires are associated with plague. And you get, in times of plague, you get shallow burial and you get mass graves. And there's tuberculosis as well. This is one more. Um, last year, oh, I, I put up a podcast uh, of a woman called Mercy Brown from Exeter in Rhode Island. She died in 1892. Now, these are the family graves. At the back, there's Mercy Brown. At the front, there's her father, George. Um, he, he died many, many years after all of this happened. And there are her mother and her sister. Now, George Brown was worried because he had lost three, the three female members of his family. He was just about to lose his son, Edwin, as well. They all died of tuberculosis. And we have it written down that George Brown didn't think that the folkloric kind of solution was going to work. But out of desperation, he said he would try it. And who can blame him when you're desperate? So what they did was they dug up the three bodies of the women in the family who'd already died, saw if they were decomposed enough, and in fact the mother and the daughter already were, but Mercy Brown wasn't. Mercy Brown was still fresher than she should have been, so they burnt her heart to ashes and they fed them to Edwin. Yeah, that's, that's kind of gross. Again, we go back to that thing with Arnold Powell, don't we? Where he's eating earth from the vampire's grave. So this is, this is a really bizarre idea. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever encountered the idea before that there is this powerful supernatural entity out there. It is potentially malignant, could be dangerous towards you, and the way that you 
throw it off the scent the way that you get it to go and get someone else is you take a part of it into yourself it's like you're becoming part of the same body it's like it's like somehow you're the same thing so it won't come and attack you anyone ever heard of an idea like that <laughs> you see drinking vampire blood is nowhere near as counterintuitive as we might think it is so people, I mean, people are doing things that are pretty gross, but it does seem to be a natural human understanding of the way things work. The second way of getting rid of a vampire is burning the body. And that's actually not a bad thing to do. If you've got a plague and um, you've got an epidemic going on, uh, then the thought of burning the bodies that might be contagious the mechanism that they worked out, obviously, entirely was, was in error. But we do have a sense from these folk stories that they have a sense of contagion. There's a good lot of reason to think that human beings do have an innate sense of contagion. And you would, you, they go to the trouble of burning a body under times like these. Generally, you don't burn bodies because they take an astonishing amount of fuel. It's very difficult to do. Um, but uh, they make an exception at times of vampire epidemics, and it probably actually helps. I love this one. <laughs> Recently remade with Colin, Colin Farrell. Fright Night, Fright Night over there. This was Jerry Dandridge, this was the first movie. If you ever try to download Fright Night, you make damn sure it's the one from the 1980s. Don't watch the remake, it was awful. You will never get that back, that one and a half hours of your life. Just. Just don't do it. Watch this one. It was good. So when we're looking at these themes, we're seeing the themes that are associated with, um, with vampires. There's the failure to decompose. People don't like the fact that these vampires have failed to decompose in the way that they were supposed to. Um, we can look at the case of a guy called de Tournefort. Pitton de Tournefort was a French botanist, and he was lucky enough to be able to see the exhumation of a Vricologos, which is a Greek vampire. And uh, so he gives us this account of what happened. And it's good, for, it's interesting for us because we can see these dual narratives going. We can see uh, de Tournefort and his friends who didn't at all believe in vampires. And you can get the account of the peasants who were there who really did believe in vampires. And they looked at exactly the same scene, but they came up with different interpretations of what was happening. The man himself had been. Um, disliked in life, standard vampire fare, uh, murdered, standard vampire fare, uh, and then people had been um, troubled by a ghost, and de Tournefort says that it was, th this guy was dissected by an old and ham-fisted butcher. It's actually a totally gross um, account, if you ever want to read it. It's the kind of thing I'm into, but you know. Uh, he, <laughs> he went to look for his heart, and he put his hands into this creature's, into, into the guy's belly, and they had to actually breach his diaphragm to get the heart, and it just it sounds absolutely repulsive the whole afternoon. Um, but the thing that de Tournefort points out was that people mistook the incense smoke. It happened in the church, and they were trying to take care of the smell a little. Uh, people mistook the incense smoke for bodily emanation. So one person saw incense smoke, another person saw the spirit coming out of the body. There were warm innards and liquid blood. Um, de Tournefort says it wasn't liquid blood. It was a stinking mess. It was half decomposed. But there were other people saying, no, 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 it was liquid blood. He said, I'm certain that if we had not ourselves been actually present, these folk would have maintained there was no stench of corruption. We were retching and well nigh overcome. So here we have these two dual strands of narrative from exactly the same thing. And I think we can see this memory conformity. That's when um, people talk about things and stories tend to get standardized. They tend to get shorter. They tend to um, sort of conform to a really funky narrative uh, that makes a good story. There's confirmation biases. People tend to see what they already believe in. Have you ever looked for something and then you see one every 10 minutes? I was looking for a pharmacy yesterday, and I never saw so many pharmacies after I found the first one. You, you look for things that you want to see and that you already believe in. Um, there's top-down processing. That's when your cognitive map of the world actually informs your perceptions. So you, the fact that you believe in something means that you do actually perceive it. So I used a tool for as, as just an aside, just to say we're going to look at decomposition processes, and people probably did report reasonably well what they had seen. But it's always worth remembering that where you've got a group of people who believe something odd, that they really can come up with honest-to-goodness 
um, accounts of what they believe happened and it still won't necessarily be the truth. We're, we're actually quite appalling witnesses as a species. This was in the corner of Mercy Brown's graveyard. So going back to these corpses, Mercy Brown was um, exhumed in January 1892. Flockinger's report was in January 1732. Both of the places where these occurred were incredibly cold and the earth was hard in winter time. They didn't have JCBs, they didn't have power diggers, they would just have a guy with a spade. So quite often you would have a corpse kept to one side. Um, in this case, it was probably kept in this, uh, in this little structure towards the, um, the side of Mercy Brown's eventual grave. So there was a possibility that in fact, before she was exhumed, that she'd been kept in a freezer for three months. It's not that surprising that she was in good condition. So we've got the failure to decompose. It might be a mistake. They might be decomposed and people just don't see it. Or it might be that actually for good reasons they haven't decomposed. They might have been kept in the cold. There's flexibility. They say that um, uh, vampires were flexible. They didn't go stiff. In actual fact, rigor mortis is a temporary thing. It passes. Rigor mortis, it depends on the, on the temperature and the, the condition of the body and so forth. But rigor mortis can end up passing from 48 to 60 hours after death. Now, people didn't keep, keep bodies around for two weeks for the very good reason that they're sources of contagion. So an awful lot of people might have seen rigor mortis come on, but they wouldn't have seen it pass again. So if somebody had been lo um, left in a field for two or three days or something, and then they were found and they were floppy, they might have thought, ah, well, they haven't started to decompose. Actually, they had. There's the case of lividity. Do you remember that um, Stanica had a very flushed and ruddy complexion? She looked really healthy. When they've been taken out of the ground, they have appeared red with their limbs supple and pliable without worms of decay, but, but not without great stench. So that's an example of this lividity. Uh, the next picture is um, a, a body with lividity on it. Lividity is basically when you die, there isn't any circulatory processes that are pushing your blood around the body. Your blood just pulls to whichever is the, is the lowest part of your body. If you're lying on your back, it'll be on your back, and we have a photograph of it here. So this is somebody who's died and laid on their back where they've made contact with the bed. You can see it's completely white. But at other times, it goes sort of purple or pink in colour. And you can see that that could be mistaken for just an incredibly livid, healthy glow. And in fact, one of the ways that you, you stop a vampire, this is stopping the vampire three, is to bury it face down. So if you have someone who is disliked or someone who is likely to become a vampire, perhaps they died prematurely, a way of stopping it rising as a vampire was to put it face down. Therefore, if you came and dug someone up a week or two later and you found that their face was livid, that's absolutely biologically consistent. It's not unusual at all. So here we have this causal relationship thing that Sue was talking about earlier, where people possibly actually even cause the lividity to occur and then mistake it for a sign of vampirism. Growth of hair and nails. This is a real red herring and basically the, the skin dehydrates. It pulls back from the hair and nails. Um, sometimes men can appear that they've got stubble. It's just the skin pulling back. There's no growth at all. Wild signs. Uh, we saw with Plajogovic, um, it, was, it wasn't that he was pleased to see them, it was that there were, uh, you know, obviously you're full of microorganisms and the microorganisms get going and they start to produce air and it can produce something that looks like an erection. The blood at the mouth and orifices and the bloating is of course related to that. Um, your, uh, you've got most of your microorganisms in your gut and that's the first thing that will start to, to get large and will produce air and uh, when uh, all of your bodily fluids start to break down then the air can just force these broken down tissues out of the various orifices. Uh, they don't really come out of your ears but you could mistake that if someone was lying on their back and they might get blood coming out of their nose. Um, so you've got, that's where you, you constantly get this fresh tissue but it could just be simply uh, breakdown, um, breakdown material being forced out by gases. And that's how we get onto how to stop a vampire for staking. If you've got something that is bloated, that is moving, and that is possibly moving through the earth, uncompacted earth, then staking is a very good way of keeping it in the grave. It is simply a large pin. 
it's very, very mechanical as a measure. And we tend to think of the cinematic and the literary vampires that are staked through the heart. You don't need to stake vampires through the heart. Bulgarian vampires quite often get staked through their abdomen, do exactly the same job. And I think that we can assume that our ancestors are very stupid and that they don't know what they're doing. In actual fact, it's a very, very prosaic measure to keep a corpse in a, a, a grave. Bear in mind that at times of plague, there were mass graves. So this was of more concern than ever. The ratio of grave diggers to corpses was very, very bad. And you would have shallow graves, you would have lots of people, and you could actually, people would say that you could hear the, the corpses popping and moving, because they were only probably three feet underneath, they were covered in winding sheets, um, and it would actually have helped to pin them down. There's also the issue of wolves and scavengers. I don't want to give you any bad ideas about these wolves, because I know them. They're, they're lovely. I don't know him too well, but she's Kaya. She's really pretty. Um, so when I did werewolves, I went and, and cuddled some wolves, and it was really, really good. Uh, but they're just making a living, you know. They're making a living like the rest of us, and they are astonishingly good at smelling things. And vampires have grave holes associated with them. If you see a, res a freshly dug grave and there's a hole in it, people think, ah, oh, that's what the, the, the spirit of the vampire is coming up through. In actual fact, it's probably just been dug over by a wolf or a dog. Lost Boys, Lost Boys over there, oh yes. That was a real 80s movie, wasn't it? So here you go, if you're going to stop wolves and dogs getting into your recently decomposed corpses, this is another classic way of getting rid of a vampire, is put piles of rock on it. Makes absolutely perfect sense if you've got a body too close to the surface. And chewing in the grave, there was a great deal of ink expended on this notion. There was the idea um, in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries that dead people made chewing noises in the grave and that they would chew each other's entrails and finger ends. Uh, there's an example of a couple of books that were written, very learned tomes by incredibly educated people. Um, it, that's why you've always got to be very careful about uh, sort of just assuming that educated people know everything because they've spoken some awful bollocks in the past. Um, so <laughs> There are certain dead persons who have devoured the linen and everything that was within reach of their mouth and even their own flesh in their graves. You've got a woman of Bohemia who in 1355 had eaten um, half her shroud. Uh, and you've got in the time of Luther a man who was dead and buried and a woman at the same time gnawed out their own entrails. They're actually eating each other's entrails. Um, so there are lots of accounts of this. It was, it was a well-recognized phenomenon. And you can see this. There was a dance macabre, which was about... 50 years after the first instance of the Black Death, it was very fashionable to do lots of uh, dance macabre death artwork. And we can see a lot of the time people think that it's skeletons depicted. It actually isn't a skeleton at all. It's a half-rotted body. You can, they very kindly illustrated all the worms for us. And um, no one ate this lunchtime, did they? I just... just <laughs> Sorry about this. Uh, and, and you can see that the, the bit there, the bit that, has miss, that is missing, is, are the viscera. Oh, Zoom into that for you. Uh, and that is actually, that is what happens. Scavengers go for the viscera. They don't go for muscle meat. If you, if you get a, a wolf going for um, something, they will, they will, first of all, they will go for the half-digested um, vegetable matter in, in, most, uh, uh, in most ruminants' guts. And it, it's, so when they were digging up these bodies and they were assuming that the bodies had eaten the finger ends or eaten the viscera, in actual fact, they were misunderstanding that these are the bits of the body that would simply disappear first anyway. Perfectly normal decomposition, but it was being misunderstood. So how to stop a vampire six? You could immobilize the mouth. That's a big one. You can put a big, you can, you can put the brick in their mouth like this. There was, this was a woman from uh, Venice. And it was Dr. Matteo Barini. I think some people were laughing because he thought she was a vampire. But I think she's a vampire too. I think that it, uh, she probably went into a plague burial pit and that they heard these munching noises. They assumed that there was some life after death. And so they went and they put bricks in the mouths to stop what they thought was the post-mortem munching. Lovely film, directed by Tony Scott. Nope. Thank you. No one's old enough. <laughs> you probably, you might recognize the guy on the right. 
David Bowie, yes, the lady over there gets it. David Bowie. It's a film called The Hunger. I don't know how the story stands up after this amount of time. I watched it ages ago. But it was directed by um, a commercials director, so it's, it's just incredibly beautiful. It's lovely to look at. Uh, and it, that's uh, David and Miriam Blaylock. That was, uh, she was played by Catherine Deneuve. Very nice-looking film. So on to the other theme, scapegoating. We'll go over this very quickly, but basically we can see it with witches, exorcisms, with, with werewolves, with everything. People find it incredibly, incredibly helpful if they can identify something. If, when life is out of control, if you can identify a culprit and then you can all pull together as a community and you can perform some ritual, it'll all go bad again. I mean, we, you know, we, we know that's the case, but temporarily it gives such a relief. Um, it provides a sense of agency to people. Uh, the scapegoat we see with witchcraft as well, and certainly with vampires. They're often disliked in life, so they're kind of almost pre-selected candidates. Uh, something that I always say about vampires, actually, is in case of witches, people have done dreadful things, tortured and murdered people for allegedly being witches. Um, at least vampire hunters had the decency to wait until uh, their scapegoats were dead before they did anything hideous to them. Let the right one in. Did you hear who was first there, Carl? Okay. Yep. Yeah, let the right one in. Really, you can try. <laughs> can try. good vampire movie of modern times. Uh, another of the themes is the throttling, and I wonder if this is sleep paralysis. This is something you've done a lot of work on sleep paralysis, haven't you, Sue? Um, I get it, so that's not so cool. Uh, it's characterized by a difficult respiration, a violent oppression of the breast, and a total privation of bodily motion. So you can see how this was described in the 19th century. Basically, the key characteristics of it, um, as described by David Hufford, were an impression of wakefulness, the inability to move, fear, and a person's actual setting is correctly perceived in contrast to a dream state where their surroundings could be distorted or false. That was Hufford in 1982 um, from a book he wrote about uh, the, the Newfoundland old hag, as it was called. So who, how many of you here have woken up in the middle of the night, you were probably lying on your back, you felt like you were awake, but you couldn't move. You possibly had an intense sense of fear. You might have had a sense that there was something else in the room. Ah, oh, the hands are going up already. Uh, yep, and you knew where you were, yeah, and it's, it's absolutely terrifying, isn't it? So that's, it's, it's kind of like 30 to 40 percent you usually get, and, and that's what it is here as well. Um, so it's actually a fairly normal thing. It's, it's, just, a, it's, it's just a sleep thing. Uh, people do get it. They tend not to talk about it. That was why Hufford went to Newfoundland, because the acceptance of the supernatural and the paranormal there gave people uh, a vocabulary. They were quite happy to talk about it, whereas a lot of the time he would be in other environments. And... Loads of people would have suffered from it, but they wouldn't have a vocabulary for it. They would feel stupid because they would, f they would say that they'd been abducted by aliens or they were being, uh, you know, raped by fairies or something like that. And they just, they didn't want to say it. So he got them to talk. Um, the secondary features of this, you can have auditory hallucinations. Uh, there could be a sexual component to it as well. Um, and it could be a feeling of pressure on the chest or difficulty breathing. It's thought that what it is is that basically it's your body is still asleep even though your mind is awake. So you're experiencing your body only breathing at the kind of necessary rate for sleep, which feels like you're being short, uh, you're being shortchanged on oxygen. This is a picture by Burne Jones, and he called this the vampire. This woman here, this was based on his ex girlfriend. <laughs> So I'm guessing it didn't end well. <laughs> and that is a very, very typical example of that kind of thing. She's on top of him. He's unconscious. Um, so we can see this, this kind of succubus, uh, hag kind of experience actually gets translated onto the vampire as well. This one was um, a similar time in 19th century, and this one was called the Lamia. And a Lamia is a, a sexual demon which throttles you, and then, you know, there's a sexual component and all that kind of thing. Uh, so we can see how, that, how somebody who was undergoing a vampire attack, perhaps the thing that they were thinking of was the recently dead person. They had difficulty breathing. They felt that they were being throttled. And then if they did die of something later, um, then you know, they, they, it would get put down to the vampire. <laughs> yes, I, there, was a, there was a gentleman in the middle of the room I heard there. It was, you have, oh, that's, that is very gentlemanly of you. Who was the second person? That was, yes, there you go. 
Yeah, sorry about that. I personally thought this was an absolutely wretched movie. I don't know about any of you. Who liked it? Yeah? yeah? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Go watch Dust Till Dawn. So, <laughs> so there we go. That's what we've got about vampires. And I think that we can see it's a combination of the fact that human beings are really predisposed to see things that aren't there. We're bad witnesses. We, we are predisposed to see the supernatural. But we're actually sort of we're reasonably good at working out what's useful as well. We do see the world in a way that's reasonably useful to see it. A lot of these measures that people took against vampires were actually quite good measures um, in times of plague. It was misunderstandings of how decomposition happened, but then that's quite reasonable because it was only safe uh, in, in modern times to start looking at corpses under controlled conditions. Prior to that, you wouldn't keep them around for the very good reason that they're a source of contagion. I think that if we think our ancestors are stupid, we do them, we shortchange them really. They were doing their best under difficult circumstances. And besides which, we've been left with the folklore and the literature. So I think we've got a good deal out of it. Thank you very much for your time.